So lots of things, very painful things of our history, and we got over them. How? With European integration. And I believe that's the answer in, in reality. But on the other side, you have to say, yes, we have to keep up the momentum, but it has to be a warning sign to the authorities in Pristina that the current situation is not sustainable. They have to act. They promised years ago, in writing, in an agreement, to act on the Serbian municipalities. And I believe it's high time that they, put, you know, that they really act and, and, and start moving in this direction. Minister uh, Konakovic, you obviously are in uh, the, the, the neighborhood. You are the, the neighbor there. How, how do you read the, the situation in North Kosovo uh, yesterday? Uh, of course, we are all concerned about happenings now in Pristina. We were hoping actually after agreement in Ohrid and few negotiations happen in Brussels, uh, the things will move on and we know it's not easy at the moment. But actually I'm promoting the political stability idea, and especially in the region of Western Balkans, who is known by political instability. So we are following situation. I hope they will stop. And I don't know, or Mr. Vucic and Kurti are coming here on this uh, event. And it would be good to, to meet him and to, to say what we think about it. Um, I would like to put the, the, the same question to you, uh, Minister Oz Osmani. You were recently in Kosovo. Um, what, what is your impression of the, the situation there and the, 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 the sort of prevailing uh, atmosphere amongst uh, the, the Albanian Kosovars? Well, first, I think what happened yesterday, it's a reminder how fragile the situation is and the potential for uh, violence that exists lays just beneath this rhetoric war that we have been seeing in the, uh, over, the, over the years. I was there both in uh, Belgrade and in Pristina in my capacity as CIO of the OSCE and talked specifically about the need to continue uh, dialogue, to continue communication, particularly to continue the implementation of the Ohrid Agreement. As you know, in North Macedonia, talks uh, took place between both sides. And uh, though there is no written uh, document to be implemented, still there are main positions have been, have been agreed. And I think it's important that both sides now will de-escalate and will continue to implement the provisions of the agreement. This is the only way forward. Otherwise, this will escalate further. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Minister, uh, what, what is your view from, from Albania on, on this question? Do you think that it is going to uh, hurt Albania's um, prospects, the, the fact that Kosovo remains so unresolved and that it is uh, such a tinderbox, as I said, still? Or do you think that it will push things along, help help remind people in Brussels and in the EU capitals of the urgency of dealing with these issues. Good morning and thank you for having us. Um, <coughs> of course, we follow what is happening in Kosovo with um, uh, very closely and with uh, a lot of attention. And I just would like to add on to what the uh, Minister Schallenberg mentioned that the EU integration is definitely the only path forward. and the only path that will ensure stability. And in that sense, of course, we also believe that the EU facilitated dialogue is the only way to move forward and to bring, to ensure stability, not just for, for um, Kosovo, but for all of our region and mutual recognition. Minister Schallenberg, I'd like to come back to the, to the issue at hand, which is enlargement, of course. And we've, we've had another development over the past few days, which is the re-election of President Erdogan in Turkey. And for people who've been Following his trajectory closely, I think it's clear that he began to essentially uh, radicalize uh, beginning in 2015 when Angela Merkel uh, more or less closed the door on EU membership to uh, Turkey. This was the, the time of the so-called privileged partnership, as it was called. And I, I think it's, it's pretty clear to most historians and political scientists say that from that point on, he sort of went on a completely uh, different direction. Do you fear that the longer countries like Serbia, Albania, and the other countries in the region are forced to wait, that we could see similar developments there, which you know, we're not only seeing in, in the Western Balkans and Eastern Europe, of course, we're, we're seeing it in uh, parts of the, of the EU itself. 
Well, I, I, there's obviously every democracy, every society is always challenged and you always have to be watchful. But I, I think it would be short-sighted to believe that Turkey, uh, 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 there's a comparison between Turkey and the Western Balkans. They're very different pairs of shoes. Um, but yes, again, and we, and you know that I don't get tired saying, either we manage to export our model of life, our system, our way of thinking in, in this region for good, and f uh, or we will be confronted there with alternatives. There is no vacuum in politics. And so, uh, if you keep in mind, 20 years ago, 20 years ago in Thessaloniki, we as European Union gave the promise that every country of the region has the perspective to enter the European Union. Now, 20 years later, where are we? We have you know, collected the low-hanging fruits, uh, candidate stages for Bosnia-Herzegovina, Austria was adv advocating it. Finally, after years, opening of accession ne negotiations with North Macedonia and Albania, um, and, and a decision in principle on visa li liberalization on Kosovo. But this is not enough. This is, uh, we know that on the surface, things look good, but underneath, it's boiling. And Kosovo now has been a system, and everybody here in this room knows how tense the situations are, actually. And I believe for us, it's a, I will continuously say, it's the geostrategic litmus test for the European Union. Are we capable of keeping our neighborhood safe, of uh, ensuring stability and prosperity there, and the, the one number one neighborhood, the most European one, is the West Southeastern Europe. It's surrounded by EU member states. It's in the center of our continent. It is not the backyard of Europe. It's the center court. It's the patio of Europe. And if we fail there, then stop talking about the geostrategic European Union. We have to act now, and we have to act quickly. Just a quick follow-up on that. I mean, this is this is a um, a line that we've heard often from from you and, and others in, in in Central Europe. But is that a message you think that has really been uh, received and taken to heart in places like Paris? I believe so, and I believe there has been a change of thinking in the last in the last uh, 15 months. I believe the 24th of February 2022 was also a watershed for the enlargement process. Um, we have started to lose the view of what it is. It is the most geopolitical transformative instrument we have in our toolbox. If I think about the enlargement, the joining of Greece in the European communities at the time, 1981, it was about safeguarding a young democracy. Portugal, Spain, 86, the same thing. And it, we have turned the enlargement process into something legalistic, bureaucratic, and with the thinking that nothing is agreed until everything agreed, until every comma, every syllable of the acquis communautaire is implemented. And that's the wrong approach. And Ukraine and the situation that we, we are created there and we are faced with there could be, you could <coughs> say, the launch pad, the carrier rocket for, for Southeastern Europe, for the Western Balkans. And the Austrian position is very clear. I don't want George Orwell animal farm among the ca candidate countries, meaning every candidate country is, uh, is equal, but some candidate countries are more equal than others. No, we cannot have the Western Balkans on the sidelines and the, uh, Ukraine and Moldova on the fast track. Let's get real. Let's uh, uh, push forward and, and create a momentum for every candidate country and for the whole region. On, on that note, I'd like to uh, remind the audience we do have a poll uh, which should go up here soon, which is when you think the enlargement process will go forward, by when will these countries join the EU, by 2030, by 2040, or uh, never. Uh, I will come back to the panel on, on, on that a bit later. But uh, Minister Konakovic, uh, well, Alexander Scharenberg says that, that Kosovo is clearly at the boiling point, uh, another area where people are constantly warning that uh, it's going to go over the boil is, is, is your uh, country. Um, how much time do you think uh, the region has to go through this process before the situation becomes untenable, before people turn their backs right. on, on um, the idea of enlargement because they realize hopefully this won't be the case, but that it's never going to happen? It's an excellent question, actually. First of all, I have to say, uh, we was wondering and discussing, is this pro and contra, actually, discussion, and I'm so happy to have my friend Schallenberg next to me, because I know his approach and approach of Austria, of course, regarding enlargement of European community. Uh, that's the right question, because this is not a one-way story anymore, you know. Uh, unfortunately, because of Russia's aggression on Ukraine, 
which world has changed completely and the policy enlargement policy inside of European community has changed completely. Like we, we had a meeting last week in Brussels actually talking with all ministers of foreign affairs from all European community countries and I heard like one voice that we need to enlarge European community and we need to do it faster than it was idea two years ago let's say. I was watching the question never was the right answer probably two years ago. I hope it's not now you know. Never is not the answer anymore because um, we are all of us, we are aware of our mistakes, of course. We know we were doing nothing, delivering nothing from, let's say, I'm talking about Bosnia and Herzegovina, from these 14 key priorities, we, were deli we delivered zero, like in last few years, last decade, let's say. Uh, but now, actually, we have a new council of ministers. I'm a member of that council of ministers, the fastest one elected ever in history of Bosnia and Herzegovina, approved in January already, only three months after the elections. It's not usual even in, in your countries, actually. Uh, in, in my country, it's not normal, let's say. And on the other side, actually, we started to deliver. It's not too much, but we already adopted many documents. We adopted uh, some amendments on the laws, actually, from these 14 key priorities. We adopted program of reforms on time this year. So we show like we are ready, we want to go faster, but now we need a hand, you know. This story about stick and carrot, we need few carrots and one stick, you know, not one one anymore. So I think the right question is because of Euroscepticism is, ra uh, is, is raised after, I have to say, North Macedonia story, because my friend Boyar Osmani and his government, they're doing excellent job and they don't go so fast, you know. So we are following situation. On the other side, we are aware of our mistakes, but I'm, I'm really open and honest. Uh, European community in my country was sleeping for decades, doing nothing, zero. Russia, China, and other countries, they're moving around, offering money, projects, putting influence in, on, in, on political scene. And now you can measure like it's not the same. So I think now we are all aware that our, our countries, they belong to Europe. We, we live in the heart of Europe. We are not on, on the edge of Europe. We are not, I don't know, like on the backyard. We are in the heart of Europe. And I think it's normal. To, 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 to get this story like much faster, to go to enlargement. We are aware of our responsibilities. We will do our best. Uh, and I have to say, to conclude, of these 14 key priorities we need to deliver. It would be hard for Austria to deliver at the moment or any other European country. So we need to renegotiate some, this process and we need to do it together. Because if we don't do that, the Russian, Chinese and other, they, they will do their job. And unfortunately, some other politics, other political parties, they already started to promote the idea to connect even Russia at the moment. They will succeed. I'm, I'm, I hope that will not happen, but we have to be aware of the situation. But Boyar uh, Osmani, uh, your country has done arguably more than, than any other has, has really uh, crossed what would be red lines for most countries by changing the name of the country, etc. And yet you're, you're still on, on the outside. Do you feel that things are moving forward or do you feel that recent events, the Russian war in Ukraine, uh, the new goal of bringing Ukraine into the EU, has slowed down your own progress towards Europe? <clears throat> well, I think there is a, an enlargement moment being built uh, since the uh, aggression uh, uh, happened. I think the awareness among member states uh, has risen in terms of understanding that enlargement contains an important security component, uh, uh, component as well and that you cannot let unattended a region at the heart of, uh, of Europe. But I hope this is not only an amplitude in this wave appro approach of the EU toward the region, because we had this discussion of this raised awareness in 2015 with the migrant crisis, when the Western Balkans played an important role aligning the policies and actions with the European Union and stop the, uh, the so-called Balkan route. And then we were hearing then this uh, raised awareness about the importance of Western Balkans and the necessity to, to, to create a fast track for, uh, for the region. And then it faded, as the crisis faded, also this uh, awareness uh, faded. So I hope this, is, uh, this will no, will, won't be an amplitude uh, 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 as well. Uh, 
North Macedonia, as you know, is a long, uh, for a long time in this process. It has started back in 2001 together with uh, Slovenia and Croatia. We were in the same group. We were the hopeful ones to, to get into the, into the EU. And then North Macedonia uh, deviated because of the bilateral issues being front-loaded uh, uh, on the road uh, uh, for us. And here we are. 18 years later, after we were granted with a candidacy status, uh, we just re opened the accession uh, talks, conditioned with a new demand, and this is constitutional changes. Just a few years after the constitutional changes, we uh, made for the, name, uh, for the name change. So uh, how people perceive it is that while wounds are still unhealed, we need to go and dig again in that, uh, uh, in that wound which creates among people a frustration and apathy uh, uh, toward the process. And uh, in, uh, unfortunately, loss of credibility. And uh, Alexander mentioned the geopolitical litmus test. I think exactly the case of North Macedonia has shown to be the litmus test for the credibility of the European idea in the, uh, in the region. What I think is missing in this process is a huge gap between the pledge and the hope for membership. There is no scaffold to maintain the process of life in between. So it's just hanging with the pledge of 2003 and the hope that one day, 2030, 30, 40, someday we will become members of the uh, European Union. And therefore, we have launched in North Macedonia the idea for more integration before membership or accelerated approach as a scaffold to maintain, to fill this gap so the credibility would remain and credibility of the European uh, idea has been the transformational force for our, for our region. We do have the results of the poll now, which uh, suggests that the audience at least thinks that you will join by 2040. Uh, only 5% say never, interestingly. Uh, Minister Fendi, in, in your country, um, there has been also enormous support for joining the, uh, the EU. Um, is, is, and, and your Prime Minister, Eddie Rama, has been uh, extremely vocal in expressing uh, his, his frustration with the, uh, with the process and the, you know, the, the sort of seeming inability of the, of the EU to, to move it on. Um, so, Minister Fino, do you, do you agree with this poll that it will be by uh, 2040, or do you, do you think that it's realistic that Albania could, could join earlier? As an optimist, I'm actually happy that I only see 5% uh, when it comes to the never option. So I, I just hope we keep it uh, that way. But um, I mean, let me just say that when it comes to the EU enlargement, I think we all know that it has been a very unpredictable pace. So there, has been, there have been times of um, fatigue outside of the EU, and there has been times of loss of appetite inside the EU. There have been unfulfilled promises, challenges, setbacks. Um, but now on paper, uh, it's seemingly very clear that um, the EU integration of the Western Balkans is a mutually strategic interest for both the EU and our region. Um, this was also echoed um, in the uh, EU Western Balkans summit in, um, in Albania, in Tirana, in uh, December of last year. I mean, this has been echoed by a lot of uh, the member states, but we all know that on paper and in reality, sometimes are two different things. And um, in reality, this strategic interest has not translated properly. I mean, it was mentioned that there has been 20 years now since Thessaloniki, and um, it seems like the region wanted to accelerate, but the EU was sometimes pushing the, the brakes. Um, so uh, the merit-based process has also been used at times to slow down this process for us, but we're, you know, now we're in different circumstances. Since uh, 19th of July of last year, we have uh, opened the accession negotiations. We've had our first IGC, and now we're working on um, undertaking the bilaterals, the screening. So there's important strides taking place, and we hope to keep that momentum both on our side, but also on the EU side. 
I mean, that does seem to be one of sort of the, the unreported realities here is that there is a lot of work, a lot of spade work going on behind the scenes. Countries are making process, but progress. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a political decision. These countries are going to have to get the okay from all of the other EU capitals in, in order to join. We have some very good questions from the audience already that I would, that I would like to get to. But uh, first off, Minister uh, Schoenbeck, given the fact that these countries have, have waited uh, these, this long um, and the, the influence that we're seeing in this region in particular from China and, and the war in Ukraine, uh, what, what is your view on the time frame here? We have a poll here that's saying by 2040. I mean, do you, do you think it could happen uh, earlier than that, 2030? I would, say? I would fundamentally disagree. Um, if we waited until 2040, we'll have lost the region. It's very clear. I mean, again, Thessaloniki 20 years ago. We have to be much quicker. And we do, we, at the, and we have, I know that we have now in Europe, because I saw the first question, there's the reform debate starting. We have to deepen the European Union before we can enlarge it. Sorry, this is rubbish. We did it in Lisbon. We have everything. We have the protocol to reduce the members of the European Commission. We have the double majority in the Council. We have, and I've been part of the negotiation team, we did it. So we prepared exactly for the scenario of having the Western Balkan states joining the European Union. Now to start artificially a debate within the European Union, we have to deepen, we need QMV on, on, on foreign policy. We have the passerelle. It's a question of political will. So let's use the passerelles and go this way, but do not please use it as, as, a, as a pretext to uh, uh, slow down the process. And we cannot wait because, as you said, there are other influences, and it's not only China, it is Russia, and it's a volatile region. And uh, if anything, then the 24th of February 2022 should be a wake-up call. Should be a wake-up call, either we stabilize our uh, neighborhood, and this is not even neighborhood, because it's within the European Union. And the neighborhood should be out, it's within the European Union. It's only surrounded by EU member states. Every problem in the region is a European problem, is our problem. And we Austrians know about it. And last year I said, you know, uh, 500 kilometers away from Vienna is Ukraine. 500 kilometers to the south is Bosnia. Uh, or I might say, Republika Srpska. Um, so, oh yes, the geostrategic uh, seismograph in Vienna, they went mad last year. Because I, I was expecting, I was fearing ahead of the elections in Bosnia, that Russia might start something. And it would be easy. So let's get our act together. And I fundamentally disagree. We have to get quicker. We have to accelerate. And I believe, because I'm positive, I believe that Ukraine can be the turbo. Ukraine be, can be the, the rocket starting the Western Balkans as well. Uh, just to be clear on the QMV point, your, your government has opposed uh, QMV. No, no, I mean, we, we said uh, the problem is we act as if it were the silver bullet. And I've been around in European affairs uh, for, for many years. We don't have a crisis um, of procedures. We have a crisis of political will and consensus. That is the point. And I continuously say that the fact that 27 member states agree on a common policy, and we, we are very good at, at belittling ourselves. Who would have thought the 22nd of February that we can agree on 10 sanctions packages by unanimity, and we did, and the largest ever. People would have said, no, we will fail, and some countries like Hungary or others will block it. Well, no. So uh, if there is a political will, we can reach agreement. And, uh, and then again, let's imagine a, a, a mission of the European Union in Western Africa against the votes of France. Um, economic sanctions against the votes of Germany. Hmm. Third countries might know that, and it would probably could lead to a weakening of our stance internationally. So yes. Um, uh, we can think about it, but please don't use QMV as if it were the answer to all the problems. What we need is a political will to act together, and then we actually have all the institutions and procedures. Uh, just a, a quick follow-up on that, because it dovetails with one of the questions here, which is, you know, given the, the size of the population in the Western Balkans, uh, Ukraine, and, and so forth, um, th this, would, this accession would be, I don't even think this would include Ukraine, would be uh, adding eight vetoes to the council uh, and the population roughly the size of, of the UK. You, you mentioned France. How, how are you going to convince a country like France, which is so 
uh, dependent on cap uh, funding for its agricultural sector to let in a country like Ukraine, which has uh, traditionally been the breadbasket of Europe? <laughs> um, I think we have to make a difference. Uh, yes, if you can think about the actions, and I wouldn't point to France, you can think about Poland and the just discussion for example, yeah. we have about transition of just grain the French from like Ukraine. To go in the it's, it, you like could say it's an avant-goût of what will happen in the negotiations. But I would say, you know, what European Union, what we have been great, and I've been myself and 20 years ago legal counsel in the European Union, we are great in developing new ideas. So let's stop by thinking um, there's only one size fits all. Um, we can have transition periods which go beyond seven years. There was always the thinking it has to be seven years. The concept of gradual integration, which we proposed one and a half years ago, and which is now part of the European Council conclusion, is exactly that. Let's develop new ways. For instance, I'm advocating why don't we have the Western Balkan countries in uh, your Horizon Europe? Why don't we have them in the, in the trans-European networks? How can we let Chinese build highways which lead from nowhere to nowhere, getting these countries indebted to Beijing, and while they should be actually connecting to EU states? Are we actually out of our mind? And who prevents us, for instance, to have a political and security committee meeting from 9 to 11 informally with the friends from the Western Balkan talking about common foreign policy on Ukraine, on Indo-Pacific, whatever it is, and then from 11 on the formal meeting? Decision shaping, decision making. We have developed such ideas in the past. They're all on the table. Again, it's political will, and it's a little bit of fantasy. And we have proven in the last 50 months that we can when we want. And I believe we simply have to want and we can do it. Minister uh, Konakovic, Alexander Scharenberg says Ukraine is a turbo for enlargement. Do you agree with that, uh, number one? And uh, we have another question here, which is, does Serbia have to recognize Kosovo for this process to go forward? Yeah. Unfortunately, it is turbo, you know, because the situation before and after aggression is completely different, I said before. I was thinking about the pools, you know. I was thinking about we, we should go to primary school to try to find the leaders which will lead our countries to European unity after 17 years from now, you know. So it's a good idea. And I was thinking, should I, will my daughter be married or not? She's, she's six <laughs> years old, you know. <laughs> if we are talking about 17 years, and I have to ask you, what do you think will happen with European community? Do you think it will be the same? It will exist. It will be bigger, smaller, you know. It's, it's really, it looks... That's what I want to explain, actually. Dealing with the reforms, and I will answer on your question, of course. Um, we have a few examples, you know, and we are completely aligned. This new Council of Ministers is 100% aligned with the foreign policy of Euro European community. We improved on that field also, you know. Year before it was 88, year before it was 44, so we are following, we are traveling, you know. And dealing with the reforms on European way, that really affects our domestic industry. We are using 44% of milk produced in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2022. Year before it was 77%. It was even bigger, numbers are bigger before. So we are going down. We cannot follow the strong European market. We cannot compete with the strong European companies. So that's what I fully agree. We should find a way to, to help to this region in economical way at the first place. I do understand the complicity of the, of the veto thing inside of the European community. So in, in the sense of administration, I do understand concerns. But in the sense of economy, I do not. Like we should concentrate ourselves in the economy to help to develop this region, to follow strong European market and companies, and then, that, then it's going to be much easier. It's really hard to explain the complicity b between Serbia and Kosovo. It is historical question for Serbia, for Kosovo also, and I cannot really predict. I don't think it, I, I never heard it is like, if you don't recognize, you will not go to, I don't know, is that official approach from European community to Serbia? If it is, I don't know, maybe Vucic should answer if he comes today here, <laughs> yeah, what, what they plan to do. Of course, we have our complicity in Bosnia because of our constitution, because of politicians from Republika Srpska. They also don't want to recognize Kosovo. So you know Bosnia didn't recognize Kosovo. I would recognize tomorrow, but because of complicity in my country and the uh, way of uh, decisions on the president's level. So it's impossible at the moment. And I think if we concentrate on the reforms, economy, strengthening actually the the the, the 
costs of life and, and, and the salaries and the important things for the people in, in, in this region, it's going to be much easier. Thank you. I would like to take some questions uh, from, from the audience. We have a microphone uh, right here. Uh, former President Carlos. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to suggest that uh, in formulating this question, uh, 2040 was inevitable because there were countries in that block, some who have lost hope and lost way and are going backwards. And there are countries who are having strong momentum. I mean, this situation is not comparable to the enlargement of 2004, where external conditions were extremely favorable to everybody. And the accession only depended on the, on the speed of the, and the ability of a country itself. It is not this way anymore. It's geopolitically very volatile what we are having. And hence, we should not talk about eight. We should talk one plus one plus one and so on. Each and every country deserves individual uh, assessment and individual process. We shouldn't put them together in the same basket in any way, thinking also of Kosovo, Serbia, thinking of Georgia, for example. So uh, to, to get the right answer, you also need to formulate the question probably a little bit differently. Would anyone like to uh, respond to that? Um, I'll, I'll throw out a, 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 a related question, which is that, you know, I think this, this, this issue of enlargement is often looked at in one way that the uh, countries in the region will benefit from the EU. The EU is already benefiting to a great degree from the countries in the region in terms of labor. There's been substantial brain drain. You have uh, governments like the government of Germany, which actively goes to places like Kosovo looking for, uh, for health workers, etc. Um, how long can that go on and, and to what degree are, are you feeling the effects of, of this uh, in your countries? Is it for me? Uh, why don't we start with you, uh, Mr. Mm. Osmani? Yeah, I mentioned previously this uh, idea or uh, the concept of accelerated integration or more integration before membership exactly for that reason because unfortunately people are not feeling tangible results from the process uh, and therefore we think that we should follow the good examples of the European Union we have so far visa liberalization transport community energy community all three are good examples how EU can export values and institutions to the region prior to membership. What we need to do is build this scaffold to maintain the structure up to membership, which is obviously we cannot decide, neither the audience here can decide when it's going to happen. For us in the region, we feel that it's becoming a moving target. Every uh, summit, I can say, there are new uh, mathematics about when this can uh, can happen. So what we need is instead of our societies focusing on the final outcome and by that blowing this uh, this uh, balloon of frustration without the deflating wall valves on the way to the uh, to the full membership the risks are that this balloon will crack and will blow out. We are seeing this in our region. In North Macedonia, the approval rate for EU has dropped from 90% to 59% in some, in some polls. And I think this, these are the first signs of this balloon of hope, this hollow gap of frustration uh, blowing out. And I think this, we will see it more and more in the region through which the EU will lose its relevance. The moment when it will stop being a winning ticket for elections, I think then we will have a speedy uh, downfall. North Macedonia is at this critical juncture when EU will not be, might not be anymore uh, a winning ticket for, for elections. So what we propose is that we change our approach. So we keep the focus of our society into what will happen next year. And we see deliverables for the country and for the, uh, for the people. So we expand these policy areas where candidate countries can be part of before membership, like, uh, uh, I don't know, the judicial scoreboard or uh, parts of single market as well. But of course, this should be coupled with uh, financial uh, support. And this means that we need to change our approach from 
eligibility to access pre-accession funds into eligibility to access structural and cohesive, uh, uh, cohesive funds. And I think this way we will be build steps, maintain credibility, keep our people on board in the process, uh, try to manage the uh, influences of third parties who certainly they offer uh, no alternative to the region but rather just uh, hijack this energy of frustration of people and they do stream into their, uh, into their uh, fields of, uh, of interest. Uh, so this should not be seen as an alternative to membership but rather as a process of maintaining credibility of the process along the way. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Minister Fino, do you agree with this? I think uh, your Prime Minister has very clear views on this question of two-stage membership. I, I just want to add on to what was said in terms of the general sentiment of the public and the population uh, in Albania having, I think, one of the highest um, support in terms of EU integration in, in the region. And it's not just about the, the generation. I mean, we, our prime minister has mentioned it frequently that it comes also from our history, right? And from, the, from communism and from what we have uh, gone through. But I think for me and for the younger generation, it's just something that it comes naturally. Uh, we do have a very high support when it comes to EU, EU integration, which should not be taken for granted, absolutely. Um, but I think um, it's just a matter of uh, looking at the picture now and where we at. Um, I, I see a couple of factors. First, the timing this year. 2022, it was mentioned here, it was uh, a big moment for all of us, I think, for Bosnia and Herzegovina and for Kosovo application and the visa liberalization decision for North Macedonia and Albania. But I think uh, what will happen in 2024, right? We have European elections. And that means new leaders, new direction, new agenda of the commission. So the year is now to make, you know, what we're discussing and all the and all the progress and all the and, and keep this momentum. Uh, another point is, and I think it was in one of the questions in the in the very beginning, um, is the EU ready to accommodate? Um, so many newcomers. These are definitely things that we should think about, but these are things that we should discuss among us. Um, and uh, another point that comes to mind is also the fact that the uh, EU and the region should think of the convergence, right? So um, of the Western Balkan countries in terms of economic convergence as well. So um, it's a lot of things to digest. And for us, again, it's a lot of things that we're working on. We've taken major um, reforms such as the comprehensive justice reform. So when we talk about, yes, political momentum from the EU, of course, it goes without saying that on our side, we should continue to do, fulfill our obligations and continue to do our homework as we have done. But, you know, it's a two way street. Thank you. That's a very good point about the elections. We also have a number of important national elections coming up uh, this year and next, including in Spain, a country that, like Slovakia, in fact, uh, has yet to recognize Kosovo. But we had another question here in the front row uh, from Mr. Schmidt. The microphone is coming your way, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> very interesting to hear. I think uh, that uh, the, the situation that Western Balkan is on the way is uh, the most important message. I would have two. Uh, questions to you all uh, dealing every day with Asia. The first is what could be or what has to be looked on European integration process? Uh, Alexander Schallenberg already has referred to to come somehow to a more improved development like we have now at the case uh, situation of Albania and Northern Macedonia uh, in, in the recent years to be more flexible in adaption of uh, the step-by-step -step approach uh, to European integration, not to lose the momentum as a message, especially to young people to say, look, we are going ahead. That's not only a vision, this is reality. What could, which, which uh, role could play regional cooperation? Mm -hmm. We're talking about Berlin process, about open Balkans. What is your option about uh, this in the uh, future? And the second is, um, um, <clears throat> I think we should uh, continue our di di dialogue in Zagayevo, but uh, uh, I think it's very interesting for all. Dayton has been set 
as a ceasefire, a peacemaker in uh, 1995. In between, things have developed. We are ahead of European integration. What would you see, um, Minister Konakovic, um, as an opportunity to implement the failure, the shortfalls of Dayton in human rights situation, as it has been a focus on the um, ethnic uh, situation uh, in the country and not on the individual rights situation. We see that there is, well, the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, a lot of questions uh, coming on. How could we implement uh, in the framework of the European Union integration process or should be there a parallel um, uh, development to work on this. Why don't we go right to that uh, question, sir? It seems like a, mm -hmm. a good one to start with. Uh, I think uh, a short answer, please, because we're almost over, and I want to get. I prepared question. myself. I was watching. I will use four minutes, so I will. Have, um, <laughs> uh, we have to go faster. We have to be concrete. They have to touch something from the people there. You know, they have to touch that the reforms are bringing results. We know this is good for the future, this is good for these 17 years. Our children, they will be in the European community. But all of us, we will lose elections and the other parties which promote even connections with Russia that is happening in Bosnia, you know what I'm talking about. Actually, they will get their followers and we will stop on this road, you know. So we need economy. We need fast reform in the field of economy. We need projects supported by European community. I know trade, I know numbers, I know everything, but uh, we, now we have to be more concrete, faster, like they need to touch. They need to be aware, like it is a future, but it is a present also. You know, if we go to that way, we will have a bigger salaries. There is a singer in Bosnia, you know, Rambo Amadeus, he sings about, and he explained, with the salary of 500 euros, you will discuss only your history and, and the problems. With the salary of 3,000 euros, you will not discuss that. And at the end, the things which is changing the most in Bosnia, it changed every day, it's our history. You know, now, there, we, are all, we are changing our history, discussing history, nothing about present, nothing about future. Some common projects, they can touch, they can feel bigger salaries, and you will see how fast Western Balkans can go to the European community. Thank you very much. I'd like to go for one more question here. The gentleman in the third row, if you could introduce yourself as well, please. Thank you very much, Matthew. My name is Edward Joseph Johns Hopkins Sice in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, great to see you. And Matthew, you very skillfully led this. We've touched on Serbia, Kosovo. We've touched on the frustration in North Macedonia. The outstanding leadership uh, Foreign Minister Osmani is le having in uh, OSCE at its most challenging time. But we turn here to uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. And the question I have for the Foreign Minister uh, Konakovic and also Foreign Minister Schallenberg, how can we speak about a EU perspective for Bosnia-Herzegovina when a prominent leader in the country is dedicated to tearing the country apart. There's no EU enlargement, no vision, no Paris if there is no Bosnia-Herzegovina. So my question for you, uh, for Mr. Schallenberg, you mentioned correctly uh, uh, these 10 rounds of sanctions on Russia. Who would have thought of that? It was so impressive. How about one round of sanctions on Milorad Dodik? And if that's not possible within the EU, uh, how about joining countries, joining the United States and the U United Kingdom in sanctioning Milorad Dodik, who has just been in Moscow, along with Alexander Vulin, plotting security to destabilize the region with Russia? Thank you. Well, this is a neutral question to end on. I don't know if you... Uh... I told you I'm going to use a few more minutes. I told you. Uh, uh, he was in Russia. He visited and he had a meeting with Putin. At the same time, uh, at the same time, SNSD, party of Milor, from Milor Adodik, is a leader, actually. Uh, they are a part of our coalition and they voted all these reforms. So they supported this law from 14 key priorities. They voted the program of free. It's really complicated, I know. But his political reality back there in Bosnia. So you know the constitution, you know House of People. They have three caucuses, Bosniak, Serbs, Croats. So he controls four people from five. We need at least two to vote. So without him, we cannot adapt budget. Nothing. Everything will stop. So we are making compromises, it's not easy. Maybe we are even paying a price in a political way. Maybe we will lose elections, but I don't care. 
because we are bringing some results, we are delivering results, and we are thinking about the future. He is a political reality. Without him, it's impossible. If someone knows how to deal with him and to take him out from Bosnia, I support the idea, so he will see this. But if not, let's be realistic. Let's try to do something, not to fight anymore, not to talk about, I don't know, impossible things. Let's concentrate ourselves and deliver some concrete results. Um, finally, Minister Schallenberg, maybe a short answer on that. I guess visiting Moscow is, is not, uh, you know, necessarily no cause for uh, sanctions, given that your own chancellor also visited uh, not too long ago. But that was a different thing, a very different thing. Um, but uh, no, there is no short answer to that, because sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm so embedded in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina politics um, that I have to remind my friends in Western Balkans are still the foreign minister of another sovereign country. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, we have to be very watchful, and, and what you said is completely right. What they're doing, some of the leaders, is for the gallery, for the public. And we had discussions within the European Union on uh, the question of sanctioning. I was hesitant. Um, I was two years ago all in favor. Last year I was hesitant. So that, that's Western Balkan politics. You have to adapt. Uh, because I didn't want him to make, become a martyr uh, during the elections. Uh, I believe we have carrots and sticks, we have to use them, we have to show them. And it was helpful, yes, that the Americans did what they did, and that the Brits did what they did. Um, but I believe we as European Union have to have a different stance. And we have to ask ourselves again and again, and that is actually the true question, how come leaders like that are still successful in our neighborhood? That is the question. How come we failed so miserably in 20 years that we haven't been able to create a narrative that actually pulls away the ground for people like that to be politically successful. And then when you say, I mean, it's easy things. We, we, we talked about gradual integration, about uh, mood and, and surveys, and that the European Union might not be the winning ticket. That's, I believe, a very important thing. And it should make us think twice. And so they're easy things. Why not uh, add them to Erasmus, to roaming, to all these things, you know? Give them the feeling Europe is real, it's tangible, and we mean business and not only bureaucrats sitting in some room and discussing about some parts of their key and nobody knows and feels anything about it. I believe this is the real way. And yes, sticks have to be shown again and again in the Balkans, but we're not. <laughs> we're going to have to end there. If I had to sum it up, I would say the message today is that Europe needs to act sooner rather than later. Enlargement for now seems not so much on the back burner as it is uh, waiting for Godot. If the EU doesn't get its act together, uh, bad things are going to happen. Good things are going to be happening to you soon. There are refreshments in the lobby. There's another panel that will begin here at 11.20, I believe, on information manipulation. Please join me in thanking the panel for this fascinating discussion today.